We have the distinct pleasure this morning of introducing to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Aronowitz. Dr. Aronowitz began his career in San Francisco, first at the San Francisco VA, and then at the California Pacific Medical Center, where he became one of the nation's first hospitalists, and later their internal medicine program director. He is widely renowned as a pioneer in the field of medicine, particularly with respect to clinical education and the didactic use of hospital images. The often heard Aronowitz, Aronowitz catchphrase, check out this cool picture, can usually be heard right before he shows you a photo of something surprising and fascinating, like, say, purple urine bag syndrome. Ask your graduating student for details. To us at the UC Davis School of Medicine, Dr. Aronowitz is known for the many hats he wears in the hospital and the education building. He's a clinician with empathy and brilliance in equal measure. He's a clerkship director and mentor, providing guidance to us all, especially those considering a career in internal medicine. And he's a passionate and inspiring teacher to students at all levels, in the classroom and at the bedside. Dr. Ronowitz has touched the lives of all of us graduating today from the School of Medicine. Whether he had guided us through our first experiences on medicine wards or used pictures to make sure we never forget the differences between cellulitis and erysipelas. Again, ask your student. It is for these reasons and so many more that we are delighted to present to you on the behalf of the class of 2018, the legend himself, Dr. Paul Aronowitz. So before I begin, I have to say that I am so proud of them. How about you guys? I want to thank Samira and Paul for that very nice introduction. And actually, I should put on my glasses so that I can see my speech here. Um, however, I'm a little concerned about being associated with purple urine bag syndrome <laughs> for the rest of my career. You can see your student about the details for why that might be. But graduates, family and friends, fellow faculty, deans, I am honored to be here today speaking at this event. While I was pleasantly surprised to be invited to speak at this remarkable occasion, I was caught a little off guard after I'd accepted the invitation and Samira and Paul wrote back, looking forward to hearing your advice on graduation day. Advice? The more I thought about this, the harder a time I had coming up with any advice that I thought they would find useful or even remember two hours after graduating. I even wrote to a half dozen prior graduates of this medical school asking them what advice they had gotten from their commencement speakers and whether this advice had been helpful. More on that later in this address. But the other hard part about giving this class advice is knowing that they already had most of the important skills they needed to be great doctors the day they arrived here at UC Davis School of Medicine four years ago. They already possessed humility in the face of complexity and a deep respect for their fellow human beings. They exhibited the integrity that is necessary to practice medicine in this complex age and already had all of the requisite interpersonal and communication skills that are vital to connecting with and helping patients and working in healthcare teams. Once here in medical school, they rapidly accumulated complicated scientific knowledge and knowledge of disease, and then they successfully learned to apply that knowledge to diagnose and treat disease. Finally, they already know and appreciate the fact that their educations do not finish today, but simply continue tomorrow and will continue for the remainder of their careers However, they will not be paying tuition, you'll all be happy to hear. <laughs> On the job training. <laughs> no, I am not worried about these graduates. They really, really do not need my advice. They will, to the last of them, be excellent physicians. Of this, I am 100% confident. So, since my job is almost complete. Indeed, all of our jobs, the faculty and the dean's jobs are almost complete. What does this leave for me to say at this event? So nothing, really. <laughs> <laughs> 
So instead of writing a speech full of pithy advice that is forgotten soon after it's said, I decided to try creating a dress that, while eminently forgettable, would at least entertain you as you listen to it. So I have written a novel, which I will read to you. Dean Bergslin is sweating right now. He's thinking that joke I made about this being two hours long was real, but it's actually a short novel which won't take me long to get through. However, before I read it, I would like to ask that if it is made into a movie, that its characters are played by Denzel Washington, Tom Hanks, and my personal favorite, Viggo Mortensen, that dashing and reflective fellow who played Aragorn, son of Arathorn, heir of a seal door in the Lord of the Rings movies. This book is entitled Adventures in the Field and a Definition to Remember, a novel in four chapters. Chapter one, technology. The doctor's son was a junior at UC Berkeley, majoring in computer science with a strong interest in virtual reality. One day the doctor's son said, you know dad, in about 10 years your job as a diagnostician will be obsolete. Computers will be able to do all that diagnosing stuff that you do. What will you do then? The doctor scratched his chin and thought about his son's comment. His son was smart and he knew computers. Do for a job, the doctor asked his son. Yes, his son said, I don't mean to be cruel or anything, but just wanted to prepare you for the future when computers crunch all the data in a split second and spit out the correct diagnosis. The doctor thought about how much time the students and the residents spent huddled over the electronic medical record, their versions of virtual reality. Maybe these computers were the beginning of the end of computers taking over since they'd assuredly taken over at least 60% of the workday for most trainees and many attending physicians. The doctor thought about this a long time before he responded. Finally, he said, perhaps you are right. But how will the computers hold the hand of a dying patient and reassure that patient that it is okay to go in peace or to communicate treatment options to a patient where two roads diverge? Huh, I guess that's true, the doctor's son said. I hadn't thought about that part. No, said the doctor, lots of people don't think about that part. At that moment, the doctor tried to think of a truly satisfying professional moment he'd had interacting with the electronic medical record. <laughs> there must have been one sometime, somewhere, but he just could not seem to recall it. <laughs> Chapter two, the doctor seeks advice from past UC Davis School of Medicine graduates. <clears throat> The, do the doctor initially determined to find some small bits of advice he could transmit to the graduates at commencement, contacted six UC Davis School of Medicine graduates to see if perhaps they had something to offer. He wrote to each asking what it was they had been advised by their commencement speakers when they graduated. All wrote back, but none of them remembered what they'd been advised by their commencement speakers. However, all had advice for the 2018 graduates. Some had two or three or even four pieces of advice, but one, the Golden Goblet Award winner from his class, wrote back with 28 suggestions, <laughs> perhaps proving that he deserved the Golden Goblet Award the year he graduated. The doctor read all of the advice from prior graduates and couldn't help but ponder his favorite items. Almost all of the prior graduates said to be curious about medicine, but more than anything, to be curious about your patients. Who are they? What are their aspirations? Where do they come from? Curiosity will connect you and sustain you, wrote one of the graduates. One wrote, it is okay not to know, but go find the answer. Eat, another wrote. <laughs> you must nourish yourself. Eat with friends. Do not eat at your desk. Do not eat alone. Go to the bedside, wrote several of the graduates. Call your mom and dad. Take the time to talk with your family, to hear their voices, to share your struggles, 
to be affirmed, to let them know how grateful you are to them and how much you love them. So <clears throat> several of them wrote, a note in the chart never saved a person's life or healed a disease. No one ever died of notepenia, wrote another. <laughs> you have an enduring responsibility to take care of yourself and your families so that you can take better care of your patients, wrote another graduate. Get up, get off your behinds and go to the bedside. Do not allow yourself to become tucked away behind a computer screen, hammering out notes like an automaton. We are meant for more than this. We are doctors. Another graduate wrote, never ever forget where you came from. The doctor moved and somewhat overwhelmed by this and much more advice from past graduates briefly considered just keeping it to himself and using it to manage his own hectic life in medicine. But this approach seemed selfish. So he decided to make it into a podcast. He would call it Notes from Past Graduates. The doctor pictured the 2018 graduates lounging on beaches and patios and front lawns from Elk Grove to Fresno to Phuket, Thailand in the time between graduation and starting their residencies. They would put on their headphones and listen to this podcast, their smiles so broad that they would crack the sky open above them. Chapter three. The doctor reflects on his adventures and how they relate to his life in medicine. In his younger days, the doctor did some pretty crazy things. When he was 17 years old, he first hitchhiked back and forth across the United States. Over the ensuing years, he crisscrossed the United States and Canada nine more times, hitchhiking and hopping freight trains, meeting people and listening to their stories. When he was only 19 years old, he bought a one-way ticket to Taiwan where he studied Mandarin Chinese and calligraphy and supported himself by teaching English. After that year, he traveled throughout Southeast Asia, at one point getting sick and getting quarantined on a cholera ward in Northern Malaysia during a cholera epidemic. He didn't have cholera, but they wouldn't let him leave quarantine until his tests came back, which took five days. 40 years later, he still thought about that cholera ward a lot because he had learned more about caring for and about patients there than during any course subsequently taken in medical school. Though a very poor, understaffed hospital, the doctor and nurses took an interest in him, were curious about him, asking him questions with warmth and empathy. His stay on that cholera ward for five days cost him 60 cents. A lot of the doctor's friends were surprised the doctor had ended up in medicine. They thought he would be a merchant marine or journalist or travel writer or just settle down and live on a small island somewhere in the South Pacific. But medicine was the adventure in his life. Some people have described the practice of medicine as sailing the seas. Others have compared it to climbing a perilous mountain or crossing through a dense rainforest or over burning hot desert. Some have even compared it to riding down the Mississippi River on a leaky raft. The doctor wasn't sure if any of these analogies really captured his years in medicine, but it was all an adventure, continually learning about how no disease presents identically in any two patients and listening to each patient's story or helping his students and residents and colleagues down the road and likewise being helped by them was the perfect adventure. He hoped that the graduates sweating beneath their graduation attire, exhilarated but nervous as they contemplated receiving their hard earned and well-deserved degrees would also feel excitement and a sense of adventure about the fields they had chosen to enter. Chapter four the conclusion and a definition to remember. The doctor contemplated the novel he had written. He was truly pleased that he had decided not to give the graduates any advice. He looked over at the phone in his office and wondered how long it would be before Hollywood would be calling to option his book and whether he'd get to meet Viggo Mortensen. But in that moment, something else caught his eye on his desk. It was Merriam-Webster's Dictionary of the English Language. He opened it to the word doctor and read the definition. 
Latin from Desera, teach. One, person who has earned one of the highest academic degrees conferred by a university. Two, two doctor, material added as to food to produce a desired effect. Three, a blade as of metal for spreading a coating or scraping a surface. Four, a learned or authoritative teacher. Five, a person who restores, repairs, or fine tunes things. Six, a person skilled or specializing in healing arts. The doctor smiled and closed the dictionary as he thought about the graduates he would be addressing, imagining them up on the stage at the Mandavi Center in Davis, California, healers, fine tuners, repairers, restorers, teachers, about to receive one of the highest degrees conferred by a university. Thank you for your attention and congratulations to the MD, MPH, and MS candidates. <laughs>